So hi guys, today we are here to talk to you about the episode 3 of the snaps in the surgery and today we are going to talk about the esophagus. So well, let's begin. Before we begin, I'll just introduce myself. Myself is Dr. Pavan Kandhari. I teach, gen- I teach general surgery on the an academy platform and I'll talk to you about a couple of courses which I'm coming up with on this particular platform in a while. But for now, let us focus on the snaps in the surgery, that is the important images in the surgery and in this particular session we are going to talk about the topic of esophagus. So let us start and let us move with it. The first image which I have is kind of pretty simple, it is basically telling you a couple of things about the clinical anatomy of the esophagus. So if I ask you guys, what is the length of the esophagus? Yep. So if I just ask you, what is the length of the esophagus? So I'm sure that you guys will tell me that it is 25 centimeters, right? So what is the length? It is at 25 centimeters. Now it starts at this cricopharyngeal kind of constrictions and it basically ends at the gastroesophageal junction. Okay, so it ends over here, GE junction, and it starts at the cricopharyngeal constriction. Now, if, okay, so now when you basically do an upper G endoscopy, you need to be aware of certain landmarks. Okay, when you basically do upper GI endoscopy, you need to kind of be aware of certain landmarks which will come across when you basically do this particular endoscopy. So, uh, okay, so these are called as the constrictions in the esophagus. The first constriction which you kind of encounter is at 15 centimeters from this incisor teeth. The second constriction or the second resistance which you kind of encounter is at 25 centimeters and the last is at the 40 centimeters. Okay, I hope you get this particular point. Now, at 15 centimeter what you are having, so you are having this cricoesophageal constriction. Then at 25 centimeters you have the crossing of the aorta and the bronchus. Okay, so you have the aorta and the bronchus. These are basically present at the 25 centimeters from the incisor teeth. And at the 40 centimeters what you have, you have the GE junction, gastroesophageal junction. Okay, I hope you get this particular point. Now, one more thing which I wish to ask you is that if I ask you what is the narrowest portion of the entire GIT? Okay, narrowest portion of entire GIT. So when I talk about the entire GIT, I'm basically talking from the mouth till the anus. What do you think? If you say that the answer is kind of ileocecal junction, you are kind of wrong. Okay, so what is the answer over here? The answer is the cricopharyngeal junction, right? So it is cricopharyngeal junction. That is the narrowest portion of the entire GIT. Followed by this, you have the terminal portion of the ileum. Terminal portion of ileum that is just proximal to the ileocecal junction. So just understand, even the second narrowest portion of the entire GIT, it is not the ileocecal junction. It is terminal portion of the ileum that is just proximal to the ileocecal junction and this is the reason okay this is the reason why in the gallstone ileus okay when we talk about the gallstone ileus the stone is basically coming and getting entrapped at this terminal portion of the ileum right i hope you get this particular point so this is about the you know cricoesophageal junction and all those stuff now moving on let's talk about another thing uh, here I'm trying to show you one investigation. Can you tell me what investigation is it? Right? So this is the investigation which I'm trying to tell you. What is this investigation? If you say that it is EUS, that is endoscopic USG, you are kind of correct. Okay, so what is this? This is an EUS, that is an endoscopic USG. Now, what I want I want you to, okay, so what is EUS? What exactly is EUS? So first let us understand what is EUS. So let's say there's a person, person who is having like, who is here. So what you basically do, you pass an endoscope from the mouth of the person and you take it down the esophagus and you take it till the stomach, okay? So you basically take this down the esophagus in the proximal part of the stomach, you basically take it over here. Now what you have done is that, At the tip of this particular endoscope, you have attached a USG probe, okay? So you have attached a USG probe 
at the end of this particular endoscope so if you have attached this definitely wherever this probe will go you will be able to take the usg scan of that so okay i hope it makes sense this is what is called as an eus or an endoscopic usg okay endoscopic usg now i hope you are able to appreciate that this investigation will be helpful for in uh, esophagus and the stomach right it is going to be helpful for the esophagus and it is going to be helpful for the stomach because this is the part where we can kind of take our flexible endoscope we can take it to that particular portion so now coming to the details of it when you perform an eus what do you find you find the image like this now in this i hope you are able to appreciate that there are kind of uh, you know hyper intense and the hypo intense lines which are basically present right so i hope you are able to appreciate that right so here they have been numbered as one two three four and five yeah i hope you are able to appreciate it now what are these guys these are the different layers of the esophagus so this is a figure from your love and belly that's why you should remember this if at all they ask you the mucosa this is appearing white on the us the deeper part of the mucosa that is appearing black on the kind of a us then muscularis mucosa uh, is also kind of appearing in a similar manner you have the sub mucosa which is appearing white then you have a muscularis propria which is appearing black and the serosa it's appearing white are you understanding my point so right just remember this deeper part of the mucosa and the muscularis mucosa that is muscularis mucosa is very very small portion so don't worry about that just remember the deeper part of the mucosa and the muscularis propria these are the ones which are basically appearing black on the us right i hope you are able to understand this now the importance of this us is that when you basically have a person with an esophageal carcinoma and you want to look at the t and n stage of this particular patient t stage and the n stage so in the t stage you basically want that how much deeper this particular tumor has gone so for the t stage and the n stage if i ask you what is the investigation of choice now you have to answer it as an eus please understand this guys investigation of choice for the t and n stage in the esophageal carcinoma it is endoscopic usg and it is also true for the gastric carcinoma for the gastric carcinoma and the esophageal carcinoma investigation of choice for the t and the n staging it is eus a very very important mcq please don't mess this up okay i hope you got the concept of the us this is a diagram from your love and belly that's why you should remember that okay so mucosa and the sub mucosa and the serosa they are appearing white the deeper mucosa muscularis mucosa and the muscularis propria they appear black on the us that is an endoscopic usg right i hope you get this point now here there is a patient who is coming to you with a very very severe dysphagia okay so patient is basically having a very severe dysphagia so what do you understand by a severe dysphagia it means that maybe the patient is not even able to swallow the saliva even the saliva patient is not able to swallow right so if at all the patient is coming to you with something like this what do you think is what is the uh, diagnosis now again definitely in the history you will find that okay the patient had ingested acid ingested acid let's say 2 years back okay so what is this person suffering from guys so this is a corrosive esophageal stricture okay now it's very very clear with the history and the findings and everything but what i want you to appreciate is that just look at the length entire length entire length of the esophagus you are having a stricture right so this is this such a, a kind of an ex, uh, exorbitant kind of a stricture formation it is happening in the corrosive esophageal kind of stricture right so if at all there is a patient who is having a acid ingestion or something over a period of time the patient may develop a very very severe stricture so this is a corrosive esophageal stricture 
okay so now it has already developed you cannot do anything about it if you want to manage it you have to go in for an esophagectomy right so for the management you have to go in for an esophagectomy and uh, after you kind of do an esophagectomy you have to go in for a kind of reconstruction with conduit so what do you think guys what is a conduit which you will use for this if i ask you which conduit is preferred okay so what do you think what is a conduit which is preferred if at all the patient has been operated for the esophagectomy for the corrosive esophageal structure now you have the options as a gastric you have the options as the colonic and yeah these are the two options available with you i hope you understand what is a conduit conduit basically means a replacement now once you kind of remove this particular esophagus out of here you cannot just leave leave this particular space empty right you have to replace it with something so you replace it with another part of the bowel now what i'm trying to ask you this another part of the bowel what will you choose will you choose stomach or will you choose the colon now if you're saying you will choose stomach you are wrong you have to choose a colon and the preferred one is the left side colon left side colon this is the preferred thing which you will use if at all you want to go in for a conduit reconstruction in the patients with a corrosive esophageal stricture now you will ask me why why stomach is not preferred why stomach is not preferred so i'll explain you don't worry so let's say you have a kind of a person who is having the esophagus and then there is the stomach like this now what do we have at the end of the stomach we have a pylorus right so okay I'll just draw it with red we have a pylorus at the end of the stomach now what is the use of this pylorus it kind of retains the substances in the stomach for some period of time so let's say if you drink water and you eat food or something like that that stays in the stomach for some period of time what is the holding time what is the holding time of this the holding time of the stomach is close to two hours right so it takes at least two hours for the liquids and the solids to kind of leave the stomach and go to the intestine now just imagine if a person is drinking acid okay this acid is going to travel through the stomach it is going to be in the like it is going to travel through the esophagus and within kind of let's say 30 seconds or 40 seconds it is going to reach the stomach but in the stomach it is going to be present for two hours so what is going to happen it is going to act on the wall of the stomach just imagine what it did to the esophagus when it came in contact only for like 30 40 seconds it is in contact with the stomach for such a long period of time so don't you think that after this particular insult the stomach will undergo kind of having this lot of strictures and the scarring and everything so yes the stomach it is going to develop stricture and scarring yeah it is going to develop this so if at all you think that okay i will replace this particular whatever the defect is i will replace it with the stomach earlier the patient was having dyspagia because of the stricture now the patient uh, stricture in the esophagus now you have replaced it with stomach the patient is still going to have the same complaints it is just that that is going to be because of the stricture and the scarred kind of scenario of the stomach so to kind of prevent this we use colon please understand these two points if at all somebody ask you what is a preferred conduit after esophagectomy and if at all in the scenario there is like overall or if at all they are specifying that after the carcinoma of the esophagus or something like that the answer is undoubtedly stomach okay it is undoubtedly stomach only if they are telling you about the corrosive esophageal stricture okay if at all they are talking to you about the corrosive esophageal structure at this particular point the answer is going to be the colon and that to the left sided colon do you get this particular point guys so yes that is something which you need to understand the preferred conduit after esophagectomy overall is stomach and after the corrosive esophageal structure that is a left sided colon 
okay i hope you got this now let's move on to the next image enough of explanation for that so here there is a patient who is coming to you with a heartburn and uh, yes and you did you did an apogee endoscopy and you found an image like this so what do you think what is this particular person suffering from so well this is a person who is having a barrett's esophagus barrett's esophagus what do you understand by barrett's esophagus guys okay so let's talk about the concept of a barrett's esophagus what is barrett's esophagus barrett's esophagus this is a complication occurring after GERD. So if at all, let's say the patient is having a gastroesophageal reflux disease, one of the complications of that is a Barrett's esophagus. So what is a GERD? This is the stomach, like this is a GE junction and this is the stomach. So inside the stomach you have the acid. If at all this particular acid is reflux and it goes to the esophagus, this is what is called as a GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, what is the epithelium which is basically present in the esophagus? You have the squamous epithelium. What is the epithelium which is present in the stomach? It is the columnar epithelium. So normally, this is the one which is having the squamous epithelium. In the stomach, normally, what do we have? We have the columnar epithelium. Now, why is this important? Because this particular acid, the stomach needs to protect itself along the action of this particular acid. And that is why the columnar epithelium is helping it. Now, what is happening over here? This acid is kind of refluxing and going back to the esophagus. If at all this happens, what is going to happen? So, I'll just write it down. Due to the kind of a constant exposure of esophagus to acid, because of this, what is going to happen? the squamous epithelium is going to get converted to the columnar epithelium right are you able to understand this point so yes i mean it's a very very simple concept nothing great about this because of this constant exposure of the esophagus to the like uh, uh, to the acid content of the stomach the squamous epithelium is getting transformed into the columnar epithelium so this is what is referred to as a columnar metaplasia okay what is it called as it is called as a columnar metaplasia which is basically nothing but a Barrett's esophagus okay I hope you get this particular point right so this is what is a Barrett's esophagus right I hope you understood this so yes I mean normally if you would see this is the squamous epithelium which is basically present in the esophagus this is a columnar epithelium which has now uh, like now this particular um, columnar epithelium which has newly developed in the lower part of the esophagus so that is what is the barrett's esophagus right i hope you are able to appreciate it this red colored thing this is a columnar epithelium which is formed by the transformation of the squamous epithelium into columnar epithelium right so this is what is a grd but why are we so obsessed with the barrett's esophagus so what like if at all this is happening that is okay why why are we so obsessed about it the point is the Barrett's esophagus, it is a kind of a predisposing factor, factor for carcinoma, right? So that is why <coughs> we have to kind of monitor it. We have to kind of take the biopsy. And if at all there is any signs of dysplasia or the carcinoma, we have to take the steps in order to treat it okay so we have to basically you know manage it by ablation or by esophagectomy or something like that but yes we are so obsessed with this because the barrets it can transform into the castrum of the esophagus and adenocastrum of the esophagus right i hope you get this particular point right so this is about the grd and the barrets esophagus and everything now i have another barium image guys with me so what is this this is a patient who is coming to you with a dysphagia now this particular dysphagia it was a rapid onset like it started three months back or let's say two months back and it has kind of having a rapid progression rapid progression
now the patient is basically having a severe dysphagia the patient is not able to swallow even the saliva and now the patient has come to you you have tried to do a, a barium swallow in this particular patient so what you are basically seeing over here okay now if you say that this is a patient who is having a carcinoma of the esophagus you are kind of correct but what are the features in this particular barium swallow which are prompting you to call it as a calcium of the esophagus? So you have few appearances in the barium swallow. One is basically called as a apple core appearance. Apple core appearance. Then there is something which is called as a shouldering of the esophagus. And if at all they have like a rat tail appearance of the esophagus, all these thing are, things are basically trying to prompt you towards the diagnosis of the carcinoma of the esophagus. So let me just enumerate these guys. So please pay attention over here. Are you able to see this? This is a part of the esophagus. So this looks like a shoulder, right? So this is what is called as a shouldering of the esophagus. Now, just for the sake of simplicity, what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw this like this. This is what is an apple core appearance kind of a thing, right? I hope you're able to understand this. It looks like somebody has kind of taken the chunk of this particular apple. So, yes, I hope you got this. This particular part, it is a shouldering of the esophagus and this central portion, that is what you refer to as a apple core appearance of the esophagus. Okay, now somebody basically saw this and they thought that, okay, this central portion, I'm just rubbing this central apple portion out. So, okay, a uh, few others, they basically saw this and they thought that, okay, this is like a tail of the rat. Okay, so that is why even the rat tail appearance has been labeled after this. Just remember, there are three appearances. One is the apple core appearance, another is the shouldering of the esophagus and the lastly, it is a rat tail appearance okay i hope you get this point now there is one confusion some books say that the rat tail appearance is seen in aclasia cardia well you can rat tail appearance it is seen in both seen in both that is it can be seen in carcinoma as well as the aclasia but if at all you have to choose between them carcinoma is a better option right i hope you get this particular point but the two are very very specific for the carcinoma is apple core appearance and the shouldering of the esophagus there's no doubt about this right i hope you get this this is how you will do it now if i just ask you what is an investigation of choice to diagnose the carcinoma of the esophagus right so can you please tell me guys, what is the investigation of choice to diagnose the carcinoma of the esophagus? The answer is endoscopy with biopsy. So you have to perform an apogee endoscopy, you have to take the biopsy, you have to send it for the histopathological examination and based on that you will be able to come to know whether it is a squamous cell carcinoma, an adenocarcinoma or something like that. But if at all the question basically asks you what is the investigation of choice for the TNN stage of the tubum, a very very important MCQ, we have already covered this, it is going to be EUS, that is an endoscopic USG, right? Please don't forget it, it is very important, it is endoscopic USG EUS right i hope you got this point now let us move on and let us talk about this so what you're basically seeing on this particular slide is it is a kind of a device which we use for a palliative management of the carcinoma of esophagus let's say if it all the esophageal carcinoma is very very advanced the, what is the main complaint the patient is going to have the patient is going to have dysphagia a very very severe dysphagia no matter what you do the patient is not going to survive for more than like three to six months. So the survival, survival is let's say three to six months in the advanced cases. Advanced carcinoma of the esophagus. So you cannot do anything to save this particular patient. Like no matter what you do, the patient is going to die. Maybe in three months, maybe in six months, maybe in seven months or something like that. Patient is going to die. At the max, what you can do, you can provide the palliative treatment. Okay, you can provide the palliative treatment. So whatever the life the patient has remaining, three months, six months, whatever, the patient could have 
the least possible problems which you can help him with something like that okay so for that what do you have for, as a palliative management you have something which is called as a SEMS right so what is this SEMS SEMS it is a self expandable metallic stent okay what is it called as it is called self expandable metallic stents okay so here what you basically do is that you take this particular so this is what is sense guys okay it is an important image please remember this this is what is sense so what you basically do you put this particular stent at the lower end of the esophagus and then this particular stent is kind of expanding and it is kind of broadening the pathway for the passage of the food or something like that right i hope you're able to understand this this is a palliative treatment which you can provide in the patients who are non-operable esophageal carcinoma patients who are not on, on non-operable you can have this now these sims they can be the covered and uncovered and there are the much bit more details of it so it can be covered it can be uncovered okay the covered ones are basically preferred for the tracheoesophageal fistula so let, let's say if at all you have a malignant tracheoesophageal fistula here the covered ones are the ones which are preferred right so yeah just that's the kind of details of it forget about it just remember this is what is sems which is used for the palliative treatment right so yeah that's all about the sems moving on so now let's talk about the next kind of image so here what do you have here you have a patient who is coming to you with dysphagia the dysphagia the characteristic description of this dysphagia is it is more to liquids as compared to solids right so what do you have you have a dysphagia which is more to liquids as compared to the solids so okay and you have a kind of a barium you did a barium fallow and you found this what do you think what is the diagnosis pretty simple i'm sure 90 percent of you guys must be able to tell me that this is a patient who is suffering from an ecclesia cardia ecclesia cardia so let's talk about ecclesia cardia okay what is the cause why is this happening what is the cause can you tell me guys what is the cause of ecclesia cardia now as simple as that there is absence of the ganglion cells okay there is an absence of ganglion cells now maybe they were absent since birth or maybe they were present and they have been destroyed or something like that so it can be the primary that is they were absent since birth or maybe they are secondary what do you understand by secondary secondary means okay they were present and they have been kind of destroyed uh, which is associated with chagas disease that is trypanosomiasis trypanosoma cruzi so yeah this is a kind of a infection which leads to the destruction of the ganglion cells and that is what is leading to the ecclesia cardia now these ganglion cells are something which are uh, basically needed for the relaxation of this lower part of the esophagus if these ganglion cells are absent this particular part of the esophagus will fail to relax okay the lower part of the esophagus is going to fail to relax it fails to relax so whatever the kind of the food and the air and the water whatever is present it is present in the proximal part and the normal portion of esophagus this is something which is dilating okay so this normal portion of the esophagus is kind of dilating so this is what you call as a kind of a ecclesia cardia i hope you get this particular point this is what is referred to as an ecclesia cardia this is what is a pathogenesis like the 
you know, thing behind the ecclesia cardia. The patient is going to develop dysphagia, no doubt. It is going to be more to the liquids because the solids, just by the sheer force, they might be able to dilate it a bit and they might be able to go inside the stomach, but the liquids, they will not be able to do that. On the barium swallow, what you will find, if at all you do the barium in this particular patient, you will find that uh, there are certain appearance. So there is something which is called as a bird's beak appearance. And then there is a pencil tip appearance pencil tip appearance okay so this particular kind of a part of the esophagus which is coming and uh, okay coming and narrowing down over here this is what is looking looking like a bird's beak or it is appearing like a pencil tip or something like that right so yeah these are the two appearance which you have with ecclesia some people call it as a rat tail appearance also but as i told you rat tail appearance is much more linked to the carcinoma as compared to that of an ecclesia cardia Okay, what about the investigation of choice? How will you diagnose it? Investigation of choice for this is a manometry. Manometry, right? So you have to perform a manometry. You have to look at the pressure at the lower end of the esophagus. If it all is persistently raised, then you basically diagnose this as an ecclesia cardia. And about the treatment, you have many options. Like you can actually go for many options. Okay, so what you can basically go for is for the treatment, you can have a medical management. In the medical, you can go in for a calcium channel blockers or the nitrates, anything which is going to kind of relax the lower part of the esophagus. Then you can have endoscopic interventions. So, what are the endoscopic interventions? You can either go in for a balloon dilation. Or you can go for a Botox or the botulinum toxin injection. So you can either go to the lower part of the esophagus and you can dilate it with the help of a balloon or you can inject a botulinum toxin in the lower esophageal sphincter which is going to kind of relax that particular sphincter. But the main drawback of this is that it is associated with recurrence like you have to repeat it after six months you have to again repeat that right so that is why it is not kind of preferable then what do you have you can have a surgery the name of the surgery is heller's cardiomyotomy where you can basically cut the part of the kind of uh, your muscle and the mucosa is going to pop out and if at all you cut the fibers of the muscle they are going to get weakened up and because of this the strength of the lower esophageal sphincter is going to go down and then the symptoms will basically go down so yes this is a kind of a surgery which we prefer and the newer treatment option which we have which they have already asked you should know at least the full form of this it is called as a poem so what is this this is what is a per oral endoscopic myectum i hope you get this point right okay so this is what is called as a poem that is a per oral endoscopic myectum okay i hope you got this particular point so this is all about the ecclesia cardia it's a very important topic just go through it i've just tried to cover the gist of it but yes i mean just read that in detail now here you have a patient who is coming to you with a uh, retrosternal pain or the kind of the pain in the chest with dysphagia again but the patient is having the pain in the chest right so uh, and then you basically performed a kind of a barium swallow and you found this so what do you think guys what is the diagnosis of this patient This is the patient who is suffering from the diffuse esophageal spasm, right? Diffuse esophageal spasm. The characteristic appearance which we get over here, this is what is referred to as a cork screw esophagus. Okay, what is the characteristic appearance which we get? We get a cork screw esophagus, and this is a 
diagnosis of a diffuse esophageal spasm, right? So this is what is a hypermotilated disorder. Ecclesia cardia was a hypomotilated disorder. So as you can see, there are multiple segmental constrictions in the esophagus. This is what is a hypermotility disorder of the esophagus, right? I hope you get this point. Right. So this is what is a hypermotility disorder of the esophagus. Now, this is again a very, very important uh, topic for you guys. So here, let's let me give you a kind of a clinical scenario. So here there is a patient who is having intermittent dysphagia. Patient is having halitosis. And patient is having kind of uh, regurgitation with development of a pneumonitis ultimately leading to the lung abscess. Do you get this particular point? So this is a kind of a scenario which you have. Now you performed a barium. Okay. So you ended up performing a barium swallow and in the barium swallow you found an image like this right mm -hmm. so you took a lateral film of this and in the lateral film you found the image like this what do you think guys what is the diagnosis of this patient so the diagnosis of this particular patient is a diverticulum so i hope you're able to appreciate that this is a normal esophagus and then there is a part of the mucosa which is popping out from this particular esophagus and it is coming out like this. So this is what is called as a, you know, diverticulum out of that. So this is what is called as a Zenker's diverticulum. What is the diagnosis? It is called as a Zenker's diverticulum. Do you get this particular one? This is what is a Zenker's diverticulum. Now, let us talk a bit about the Zenker's diverticulum. Why this is happening? what is the cause of this so basically the problem lies in the inferior constrictor so here you have two kinds of fibers you have a kind of a thyropharyngeus these are the muscle fibers and then you have a cricopharyngeal muscle fibers now what is basically present between them is there is a potential space this is what is called as a Killian's triangle okay so if at all there is a neuromuscular incoordination neuromuscular incoordination so because of this what is going to happen there is going to be an increase in the intra luminal pressure and if at all this happens, what is going to happen? The mucosa inside the esophagus, it is going to pop out from this particular potential triangle. Are you able to understand this? So because of the rise in the intracranial pressure, intraluminal uh, pressure, what is going to happen? The mucosa pops out and it leads to a formation of a diverticulum, right? I hope you get this particular point. So this is what is called as a Zenker's diverticulum, right? Right. So this is what is a Zenker's diverticulum, right? So if I ask you, is it a true or a false diverticulum? It is a false diverticulum. It is a false diverticulum. Why is it a false diverticulum? Because as we know, only the mucosa is popping out. All the layers of the kind of the esophagus are not coming out. So it is just a false diverticulum. So as you can see that, let's say this is the normal esophagus and then the mucosa is popping out like this. So whenever the patient is going to have food, a part of it is going to go and rest in this particular diverticulum and over a period of time it will get partially digested and everything then the regurgitation might happen it might go to the lungs ultimately leading to the pneumonitis and the lung abscess and all those stuff so if i ask you what is the most common complication okay what is the most common complication which can happen over here most common 
complication which can develop in the Zenkel's diverticulum? The answer is it is lung abscess. Lung abscess is the most common complication. And if I ask you what is an investigation of choice, the investigation of choice for the Zenkel's diverticulum is a barium swallow. And that too, you have to take a lateral flip. Please remember this. It is a very, very important question. What is the investigation of choice? Investigation of choice for the Zenkers diverticulum. It is a barium swallow in the lateral flip. Okay. And you will get an image like this. You will call it as a Zenkers diverticulum. Right. I hope you get this particular point. Now, this is a very, very small topic. You just need to remember what exactly is this. So here there is a patient who is coming to you with an intermittent dysphagia. You performed a barium swallow and in the barium swallow you found this okay so i hope you're able to appreciate that this is a part of the esophagus which is coming and then the part of the esophagus is going in like this right so similarly over here so what is the diagnosis guys this is what is a per person is suffering from the esophageal ring okay so this is what is a Esophageal ring. Do you get this particular point? Intermittent dysphagia with this kind of a barium finding the person is suffering from an esophageal ring. Now, there are three types of the esophageal ring. The important one is a short keys ring. So, this is the ring which is basically present at the squamocolumnar junction right the cause more or less it is because of the GERD gastroesophageal reflux disease so there is a ring at the junction of the squamoesophageal junction a uh, squamocolumnar junction and yes that is what is called as a short case ring this is a type b ring okay this is type b ring then you have a type a ring which is basically proximal to it and the type c ring which is basically distilled to it but just remember short keys ring is nothing it is a type b ring just remember this just have a look at this particular image and you will be basically asked about this right so i hope you get this point right okay now lastly let us talk about some esophagitis so this is a very very important portion of the esophagus okay esophagitis now, if I ask you that, okay, I don't say anything. If I just say that this is a kind of a barium swallow, obviously. And this is being done in a patient who is suffering from esophagitis. Can you please let me know what is the infection in this particular patient? Can you able to, are you able to appreciate what is a uh, kind of a infection this particular patient is suffering from? So please understand guys, here what you're basically seeing is a shaggy appearance of the esophagus. Shaggy appearance of esophagus. And this is a feature of a candida. Please understand this point guys, okay? The shaggy appearance of the esophagus is something which is present in the candida. I hope you are able to understand this. Very, very important, okay? Maybe they will not uh, kind of show you this particular image, but this particular finding that the shaggy appearance of the esophagus, it is present in the candida esophagitis, it is very, very important. So we'll talk about this again, don't worry. So in the candida, let's say if at all we have a candida. So if at all you perform an upper GI endoscopy, if at all you perform an endoscopy, what are you going to find on the endoscopy, guys? Here you are going to find kind of whitish and yellowish nodules at the lower end of the esophagus. But if at all here you end up performing a barium swallow, here you are going to see this shaggy appearance. I have already talked about this shaggy appearance of the esophagus now why is this that important because you know what one of the very very important differential diagnosis what is a very very important differential diagnosis which we have over here right so one of the important differential diagnosis of this shaggy appearance of the esophagus is it is an esophageal varices esophageal 
varices please remember this okay so this can be emphasized by the fact that you know in the love and bailey in only the one page they have given you both the images shaggy appearance and the esophageal varices ka barium swallow so that you can appreciate the difference between them just go through that once then there is something which is called as a hsv infection herpes simplex virus infection so in the herpes simplex virus guys uh, if it told you perform a uh, upper gi endoscopy okay if it told you perform an upper gi endoscopy what is a kind of a image or what is a finding which you get so in the kind of a hsv infection you basically get a punched out lesion what do you get you get a punched out lesion and then there is a kind of a cmv cytomegalovirus infection if it told you perform an upper gi endoscopy in the cytomegalovirus infection what is the finding do you get you get serpiginous ulcer okay so this is very very important how can you remember it so please understand uh, this hsv what do you get in the hsv you basically get a just tell you one thing okay so what do you get over here hopi simplex virus infection what do you get you get a punched out lesion so you can remember it by the hp so so many of you guys must be using hp laptops and everything so yes you can remember it like that hsv infection you get a punched out lesion and in the cmv what do you get you get a serpiginous ulcer the way to remember it as a cs right so all of you guys must be having some of the other friend who is doing computer science as a part of an engineering just remember them and just remember the serpiginous ulcer is being present in the cytomegalovirus right i hope this will help you that's all about today guys thank you so much so guys i just want to give you a small information that i'm coming up with a new kind of a Uh, course on the an academy platform that is called as a talking tube bank it is going to be real fun in this the entire general surgery is being revised in 44 hours so we are going to have like 22 sessions and in these particular 22 sessions we are going to revise the entire general surgery it is starting on 1st of september this course has already been launched you can just go and check it out the point is like all these 22 sessions are going to be packed with mcqs okay so every kind of uh, you know session is going to be two hours and i plan to take close to 80 to 90 mcqs per session 80 to 90 mcqs with explanation in two hours so just imagine like 22 hours we will be end up covering at least like say 1100 or 1200 mcqs of the entire general surgery it is going to be fun just check it out if you are at all interested into it it is starting basically on the 1st of september so if at all you are a kind of an academy subscriber please don't kind of mess it up it is definitely going to help you for your need pg if you're not you can consider becoming a part of it because there are so many awesome courses which are present over or in the on this particular platform you can use the promo code dr.pavan and basically take it at the same time now an academy has been partnering with uh, prep ladder as well so if at all you want the kind of subscription for both together like an academy plus the prep ladder you will get all the kind of notes and everything from the prep ladder but this is basically available for one year two year like one year 18 months and the two year kind of subscriptions you can just check it out and even there you can use this particular promo code that is dr.pavan you will end up getting like 10% discount on whatever the subscription you take that's it guys thank you so much for this particular long session i hope it helped you a bit and yeah see you soon keep calm happy studying see you soon bye